So moving on to review of the minutes um, of the February 11th minutes. I uh, they they fine to me. What do you think? Yeah, they looked. Uh, I checked them out. They looked good to me too. Okay. Moving right along. Hello, Amy, by the way. Um, continuing business, financial review. Review of capital projects. Maybe Thank you wanna? <clears throat> Thank you, Douglas. I will uh, share my screen if I may. This is a summary of the capital projects, um, the overall bid results. We're very pleased with the bid results. It was a very competitive bidding environment. I just wanted to provide a high level overview holistically how everything landed. We will be within the agenda going through these projects um, sequentially. But overall, very positive bid results. Um, we came in 124,000 below what we had originally estimated, about 15% under. We also saw quite a bit of competitive bidding as well within these capital projects. Um, in con consultation with our um, insurance cooperative click, uh, we did revise the umbrella insurance uh, in the past. We had it locked in at 20 million, which scared away quite a few bidders. It was excessive. And as a result, we modified each of these bids to make it appropriate to the size of the projects, thereby uh, allowing many bidders to compete and um, look forward to going through them as we progress through the agenda. Okay, thanks, Abe. Sorry, couldn't find my mute button. Um, the transportation bid as well. We'll go through that. We'll go through that later, right? Or we'll um, go through it now. Um, I, I wanted to provide just a quick update. Uh, certainly, it's not on the agenda for uh, recommendation and approval until the April meetings. But um, we did have um, our bid res our bids were uh, turned in yesterday. And so I just wanted to provide a quick background. That way we can discuss it over two months and not just the one month. And speaking with my colleagues, we did compile quite a bit of peer comparison data on when other districts went out to bid, what sort of increases they've seen. And by and large, the vast majority, I shared with my own personal experience the last two bids where we received just one bid, which was the incumbent. Um, many districts are in a similar uh, condition as well. And it shows just a, a wide range of increases, typically double digit increases. And within our own um, bid process, which um, by the way, you know, we did start back in December, a very long and arduous process. We did have six transportation firms participate in the process. Bids were received yesterday. We received two letters declining to bid and one bid, which was our incumbent bidder, Durham. Below, I've at a very high level, I've not had a chance to go through the bid package uh, in detail yet, um, but preliminarily, we're looking at a 6.35% increase for next year, and then locked in at a 3% increase each of the following subsequent two additional years. Historically for our district over the last three years, we saw a 5% increase and 6% in each of the last two years. So I'm pleased with the 3% in years two and three, not so much with the initial at 6.35. Some of the reasons why I suspect, you know, we, we typically see single bids within um, the school district environment. It's a large capital investment for companies to come in and kick another company out. There needs to be a, a hub location within a specific radius of our school district. And that does um, delimit quite a bit um, who is able to, to find that um, capital investment to make that work. Notwithstanding the many zoning restrictions around parking buses makes it even more difficult. And some of the large increases I shared with other districts, ours isn't nearly as bad. Um, 
you know, a number of reasons. Liability insurance uh, has gone up um, by a multiplier. And on top of that, it's the labor costs. We've seen obviously minimum wage go from 9.25 in, in 2020 to 2025, it'll go up to $15. So those are some of the driving forces behind why we're seeing single bids, as well as why we're seeing um, such large increases over the past few years. So I will need more time to analyze um, the submission and I will bring back recommendation at the April meeting. Any questions on this update? Okay. Thanks, thanks, Abe. And now for our COVID-19 update for our superintendent. Um, not much really to update. Um, last board meeting was sort of the, one of the bigger updates I've given. Um, not a whole lot has changed other than vaccines are still going out. I think a number of us have had shot two in the last day or two. And so it's going to start up uh, for the rest of the staff as well. Um, so again, not, not a whole lot to report on that front. About how much of the, um, do you know how much of the um, teacher population has at least gotten one shot? We're trying to estimate that. Um, we are confident that in the last four weeks, anybody who has wanted it should have gotten the first shot um, last week. Certainly have a couple of stragglers this week had you know problems with their accounts and things like that. Uh, but we're going to be looking to provide a uh, more accurate estimate in the future. Okay. If I may add to the COVID update, um, just an update on the Binax Now rapid antigen test. We, um, Jenny has been working hard in procuring them from the county. We're supposed to get, I believe, a thousand tests and we have yet to be able to procure them. As a result, um, in checking with peer districts, uh, we've been in touch with Passport Health, who was able to, to provide us these tests. And so we're in the, in the, in the phase of um, working through that with Passport Health and, and getting some tests to start with, at least for our students um, that uh, display symptoms, we will be able to test them on site. Great. Does anybody else, um, other board members or Al, have any other questions? Abe, are those um, antigen tests, are they free to school districts or is there a cost associated with them? Through Lake County, they are supposed to be free. Oh, um, through Lake County, okay. Correct, but in working with this company, it will come at a cost of $10 per test. $10 per test, okay. And would that, that would go okay. under COVID, right? That would be a COVID expense um, moving forward for getting mm -hmm. re refunded from the federal government or this local government, right? Correct. That's something we, we could apply for reimbursement for. It's a direct reimbursement, in my opinion, um, you know, very easily reimbursable through the ESSER Round 2 grant, which is it's approximately just under 600000 for this district. Um, but it's supposed to carry us through 2023. Um, we've had quite a few costs and not just this, but um, sure. we're able to start with a kit of 20 in each building and we're able to procure more as needed. So it's not an excessive cost um, if we're only testing those students that display symptoms. No, I'm, I'm not concerned about the actual testing. I'm, uh, that's not my concern. I'm really glad that we're doing it. I, I believe that other districts have been doing it for a while. Um, so I was um, curious as to, the, you know, how they've been doing it. If it is something that can be written off, um, it's definitely something we should be engaging in if we can. But, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, I, I have a, a question regarding costs for COVID. Um, is there, like, a running kind of, you know, spreadsheet or place where you guys are keeping track of COVID costs and could that be shared with us? Absolutely. Um, 
we've actually created a project code within our accounting system to delineate those costs associated with COVID. We've used that database to submit our ESSER one, round one uh, expenses. Um, and certainly we'll use that for the next round as well. And absolutely, we can share uh, a running total with you, uh, the board as well. Yeah, the whole board, yes. Mm -hmm. Abe, um, you may have told us this before, but did the, the round one was submitted. Have we received the payment for that yet? Have we received that we check? We did, yes. Okay. And how, how long did that take? Um, it was immediate. You know, they were actually okay. That's great. Us to you know to 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 file the submission. So um, it was immediate. Do you know how much that was for? Round one, I don't have that in my fingertips, Douglas. Um, but I do know round two is just under six hundred thousand. I believe round one was in the neighborhood of two hundred thousand, maybe. Um, certainly, I can follow up on that. And yeah, get that's fine. Yeah. Information on that as well. Anybody else? for COVID-19. Okay. Moving on to new business, recommendation to award the test court improvement bid for, for North. Yes, um, just wanted to remind um, the board um, about North's tennis courts. Um, the building, by the way, is already 17 years old, um, which dates the tennis courts at that age as well. Um, the surface is now at the point of causing injury, perhaps with large cracks throughout, as well as settling um, on this corner. And so we went ahead and bid that out again. I shared the um, bid results, got multiple bidders involved. And, you know, essentially a tennis court um, in the area, and, and this one particular, uh, as well as at Central, they're just an asphalt parking lot, essentially with an acrylic coating on top. Um, so the fact that it's lasted us 17 years, um, that's great for an asphalt um, surface. Chicagoland Paving um, is the lowest bidder. We have an issue with Chicagoland Paving. They listed um, Lake Forest School District as a reference. And uh, in just checking that reference, I came to find out that that tennis court had failed and it's currently in litigation. And in the litigation portion of the bid submission, they did not disclose any current or pending litigation. And when questioned, they um, you know, just said it was a clerical, clerical error. Um, and so just through that review process, uh, we're not comfortable in proceeding with the lowest bidder. We're recommending um, the second uh, lowest bidder, Abby Paving, who had uh, very positive reference checks. Um, so, yeah, that's the recommendation, Abby, Abby Paving, to complete the project. Um, another point, none of the uh, materials from, in checking with Abby, none of the old demolition material will end up in a landfill. It will all be recycled and be used as um, either an asphalt base course or stone aggregate in future projects. Um, there is an alternative A, which we're also recommending, which initiates separation. It initiates the cracking in between the tennis courts, thereby uh, eliminating the probability of it cracking within the court of play. And so that's another recommendation we have um, with Abby Paving. Company. Can you repeat that, please, what that, what that was? So absolutely, Hal, essentially it's a joint between intermediate between the tennis courts so that you're initiating a separation between the courts. If there's stresses within um, the overall surface, expansion, contractions, um, it has room to do that with these joints in place. If there isn't, if it's continuous large lot, um, it'll crack on its own uh, over time in various places as yeah, if you show the, yeah, if you show that picture before, you'll see that the cracks are on the main play where the stressors will be out of the game play. So the cracks will still come because as Abe's saying, they're going to come naturally, but they'll come essentially out of the game play. So it won't affect game. Any questions related to this project?
<laughs> I appreciate that you check references. I mean, I know that you do, but thank, thank you. you. Good deal. <clears throat> okay. Um, moving on to uh, the recommendation to award the drainage improvements. Yes. I think this is our third year of attempting to bid this out. Um, again, I mentioned scaling back the umbrella insurance requirement um, and scaling back the scope of work, um, one where um, it's simple water conveyance. Um, it addresses the concerns that are back there. And um, we did check references with Lenny Hoffman excavating, came back very positive. We did a scope review to make sure he's captured everything that's required within the project. And uh, we're very comfortable in recommending them at a base bid of 42,763. The grant funding is still available uh, to us, um, $34,000 of SMC funds, but it's at a reimbursement of a 50-50 split. So we get approximately 21,000 back as a school district. There's an alternate, we're gonna check the existing flared and section of the storm pipe. If it's in good condition, we'll leave it and get a credit. Otherwise, it's within the base bid to replace it. Any questions regarding the the uh, award award uh, drains improvements? Difference in the base prices are very different. <laughs> Um, I, I know you did a review of the requirements. Did that cause any concern seeing the, these kinds of jumps? It did. Um, standard deviations more than what I've seen typically. Um, but um, it really comes down to the estimator and thinking through what sort of equipment they need, what sort of equipment they, they either own or have to rent. Um, you know, where they're going to be able to use the materials. And in this case, um, you know, the materials removed from Lenny Hoffman excavating they have another project where they be, they'll be able to reuse that and it makes it more of an efficient um, bit as a result for them. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to 6C, uh, recommendations toward the parking lot improvements for Central and the courtyard, sorry. This was- for, uh, for, yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, this was a combination bid for the courtyard at North as well as paving repairs at Central. We've identified um, certain unique areas for mill and overlay. Um, the rest of the lot, um, we would like to seal coat and restripe. The striping has faded um, extensively. And so overall, um, just as a reminder, here's just some pictures. We're looking at the service road um, between the school adjacent to the football field as well as the district office lot for mill and overlay. Those were not addressed in the recent uh, resurfacing about four to five years ago. And so we wanna take the opportunity to do that this time around and then um, seal coat the remaining lot as well. Reminder of the pictures at, at uh, north of the courtyard. So just from original installation, we believe there were compaction issues, just uh, improper preparation, perhaps um, certainly lack of maintenance because the sand has washed out over time, leaving almost no sand material um, within, allowing water to go through, freeze, thaw, expand, and create further gaps over time. The other issue is there is a storm drain within the center of the overall courtyard. Water is pitched to the door. Oh, and so that's, uh, we're gonna take the opportunity to, re to remove the pavers and install additional storm drains to capture that uh, water as well. So it's addressed going forward. And yeah, just a reminder of uh, some of the uh, issues we have. Outdoor learning environments are gonna be an asset um, going forward and we want to restore this and make it uh, more pleasing and usable for our students and, st and staff as well as safe. This is a bit summary of the combination uh, bid. Um, shorter was the low bidder of both projects. Again, references came back very positive. Total base bid of $208,313.15. Uh, 
We're also recommending alternate one, which is the mill and overlay of the district office lot, which is showing signs of alligatoring. We're simply recommending the mill and overlay of the top inch and a half uh, surface course asphalt material to extend the life um, of the lot. And just as a reminder, you know, uh, this lot at 105,000, we feel is extremely value added for preventive maintenance purposes. Um, far better to do this every four to five years versus a multi-million dollar level project that we saw after 15 years at North, um, avoiding to have to rebuild the entire cross section of the parking lot. We're able to simply do a surface mill and overlay and continue to extend the life of this very important asset. Alternative number two, um, we put in there more for planning purposes. It's going to be uh, the next topic or a later topic as it relates to the intergovernmental agreement possibility with the village. It's the north lot. It's a simple cost to seal code, stripe, and number um, those stalls. More to come on that, but essentially it's a planning purpose number. We, we're not going to proceed with that just yet. Um, it may be a shared cost between um, both entities possibly if we're so inclined to proceed. And that's all I have for this combination bid. Any questions? So Abe, um, for the courtyard, are we able to, are they able to reclaim any of those pavers? Some of those look like they're in pretty good shape. Pavers are gonna be reused, absolutely. They're gonna be reset um, and reinstalled, absolutely. It's mostly labor. Looks good to me. Maybe, maybe I'll have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, moving on to the uh, what, health, dental, life insurance renewal for 2021. Thank you very much. So last couple of years, we've used reserves to um, afford basically a 0% increase on premiums for our staff, as well as um, you know, for the board um, using those reserves. Um, so by applying these one-year credits over the last couple of years um, has not stopped the compounding escalating costs of health insurance. Like that curve, the increase in costs have continued, applying a one-year credit to minimize it only fixed it for that given year. And so with all of that having caught up with us, we were looking originally um, at a 19.5% increase. We've um, done a couple of things with the Insurance Advisory Committee. Um, one was to modify our prescription plan, which was extremely dated. Um, it, it affords over-the-counter drugs to be prescribed um, for very minimal savings to the employee, but at a significant cost to us. And by Modifying that plan, um, we did run an impact analysis with our staff as well to make sure no one's going to be um, negatively impacted based on what uh, our folks are taking now. Um, by changing the plan, we we're able to save about $100,000. The second lever we applied was to use uh, a smaller amount of reserves this year um, and still maintain $250,000 and still maintain the minimum balance uh, we target at 40% on hand to um, process any claims. The overall impact <clears throat> as a result uh, for HMO, it's 3.8%. The uh, self-insured PPO plan uh, overall, 10.68%. No change on the DHMO for dental. For the PBA plan premiums, that's going to increase by 13%. Um, and no increases on life insurance or the EAP the Employee Assistance Program at this time. Okay. Anybody have any more questions on that? Or any questions? What does 10% mean in real numbers uh, for an increase? What does that actually mean for, for, our, for, our, for people? Well, Yes, um, I do have a sheet that's within the board packet. Perhaps I can pull it up, but it's the last sheet that shows uh, this year's premiums, and it's going to vary based upon which plan and what sort of coverage one takes. If it's single, it's 100% covered by the board. Okay. Um, 
and then there's a, um, a credit. Um, essentially, a lot of the cost is on the employee for um, children, spouse, or family. Okay. Sorry, I thought there was a cricket in there. Uh, I was on that sheet as well. Um, was there a specific question, Kathleen, uh, about any one of those? Do you want me to pull it up? Yeah. Sorry, I don't have it in front of me. I can't oh. access it right now. Sure, sure. Do you have it, Abe? Because I have it right here, too. Yeah. yeah. What, how much did we use in the reserves in the last couple of years? If this year it's 250000 what was previous? I don't have that number um, at my fingertips. Uh, Hal certainly can look it up, but I want to say, um, you know, it's going to be in the neighborhood of about six to seven hundred thousand. Okay. I do have another sheet which has it by percentage, um, but I can zoom in here. You can see um, for the employee um, HMOs from last year to this year, some of the differences, um, 983 to 1088. Considering the fact that there hasn't been any increases for the last three years, averaging it out over the three years at 10%, um, you know, isn't unreasonable from what I've seen. Pull up a Google sheet here and just plug some quick numbers. Um, and you said you ran this by, um, you run this by people that they, they, they know that this is coming or? Yes, we have an insurance advisory committee, um, which is made up of uh, teachers, um, uh, union ESP staff. And so collectively we review, um, you know, the overall performance for the year and collectively um, you know, we talk through um, recommendations and what would be best suited going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's been a very successful committee over the years. I think. I mean, with that collaboration with the with all the with all the players. Yes, I've I've heard that. Okay. Maybe any other questions from anybody? Abe, you okay with this? Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. <laughs> How are you there? I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Oh, thumbs up. Hal. Thumbs up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, I'm good. Screen. I'm good. I'm sorry. I'm on the no other worries. screen. No worries. No worries. All right. Um, so let's move on to the recommendation to approve the inter inter intergovernmental agency agreement. Um, for village parking lot adjacent to, to Central, which is very exciting. Yes, um, this north lot up here, it's owned and operated by the village. I think you all know that. Um, they charge our kids $2 per day to park um, over the course of a year. It's uh, much more costly than our parking pass. And um, beyond the cost, administratively, we don't have much control because it's not our property. Um, I've heard it can be somewhat of the well, well west up here. Um, we did have a preliminary conversation with the village if they would be open to the concept of an IGA. Um, you know, perhaps conceptually we could uh, snowplow it and they would maintain the lot. And we could then issue parking passes to our students that could help <clears throat> really help manage um, parking overall um, for the school. And um, yeah, um, so at this point, I uh, really just wanted to throw the concept out um, to, to, to the committee. Um, want to know if there's any opposition just to continue the conversation. Um, we're not recommending to proceeding at this point, but rather just want to provide you a heads up and want to get some preliminary thoughts before we uh, engage in a conversation with the village um, to come up with some parameters. Um, we're thinking um, shared benefit as a, to, to both entities as far as the revenue generated from the parking passes. 
I like the concept, but what does the acronym IGA stand for? Intergovernmental Agreement. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Intergovernmental Agreement. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's great to be able to do something with that and have some kind of agreement. One thing that I've been aware of is that some students do not buy a pass or do not need a full-time pass, and they have used that because they don't need to pay for a full pass. Um, they, they carpool, they use, um, they might drive occasionally, um, and so it actually lowers their cost to use that lot on occasion. So... Um, you, that would be eliminated. So not everyone can pay. Not everyone can pay for a full pass. Perhaps. Or wants to pay for a full pass. Um, I know kids that changed it back and forth. One time, one paid for the couple bucks, and the next one paid for the next couple bucks, and they split it up. I know a lot of people who did that. And they just bypass the whole the whole um, lot thing altogether. I'm not saying that's just letting letting you be aware of that. It's a good uh, good point, uh, Amy. We'll take that back and discuss it with Central's administrative team. Um, just thinking outside the box, perhaps we designate an area where they can continue to do that. You know, perhaps one of the lanes, um, depending upon what percentage. Um, you know, we feel well, we'll use it for that purpose. Mm -hmm. I've heard that too, Amy. Um, I've also heard, and you've also heard of the, the problems parking at Central. So I think the, you know, it's maybe there's some, some balance, Absolutely. right? Yeah. No, I think, I mean, I, yeah. I'm all for trying to do something here. I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely all for doing something here and doing any kind of agreement would be good. I just wanted to alert you of that. Very good point. Good point. Okay. How are you good moving? Well, I mean, I guess we're just, this is just off by eye at this point. Okay. Um, anything else for that one? I also think it's great that you're doing some, that some, some discussions about parking are happening with a village, period. So thank you. Okay, moving on to 6F, recommendation to adopt the teacher's retirement system of the uh, state of Illinois submitted savings plan, the 457 plan. Yes, um, thank you, Douglas. Again, um, this is um, a TRS supplemental savings plan. Um, and offering this plan is apparently a requirement of TRS. It's similar to a 403B. Um, essentially, the difference between a 403B, uh, some of the main differences, it allows you to contribute more and with higher limits for the catch-up phase towards the end of one's career. The other benefit, it allows you to take your money out before 59 and a half years, uh, essentially without penalty when you leave the employer. The motivation we feel is really to offer more options to our tier two TRS teachers, which have uh, less benefits than our tier one teachers. So that I believe is who we're targeting um, with that. Um, and so just again, it's, it's a, uh, the plan is a TRS uh, requirement um, and we recommend moving forward, um, approving the resolution, offering this additional option to our teachers and staff. Any questions, comments? Seems like a good, a good thing to be doing for the tier two folks. Agreed. Um, anybody else? Amy, Kathleen, Aaron, Jay? Okay. 
Um, we do have a, a need to go in closed session um, to for personnel for administration, administrative contracts and non-union compensation. So, Nicole, can you take it from there? Do we do we need a motion? Uh, we need a motion. Oh, we need a motion. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a motion. I have a okay. motion to go into closed session. A uh, second. Second. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, I'm going to be bringing everybody into uh, breakout rooms. So here we go. Babe. Here we are. Babe. Here we are. All right. Uh, let's see who's here. Okay, so um, we need to see if there's any topics for future board meetings or uh, FNF. Hal or anybody else? Uh, no, I right now I Me don't. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Okay, I like to call the call meeting to adjourn. Friday. Do we need a second still? Second. Okay. All right. We are adjourned. Uh, Amy and everybody, I'm I'm gonna go have to go take care of my dad. So um, I'm gonna be signing off too. Okay. Be well. Okay. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Douglas. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Douglas. All right. Are we good to keep going, folks? Yeah, let's do it. All Just right. give me one second, Amy, so I can log on to take minutes for you. Absolutely. Okay, all set. All right. It's the Program Policy and Personnel Committee calling to order at 731. Uh, Amy Knudsen Strap Chair. I see um, Aaron Westfall. And I see Jay Reynoso. Yep. Okay. All right, so the committee is here. Uh, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any public participation? Opening at 7.32. Nobody uh, from the public is in our room. Okay, we will close public participation at 7.32 in 10 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so reviewing the meeting minutes from February 11th, 2021. I reviewed them. I didn't see anything unusual. Aaron? I'm good. Okay, Jay? Looks good to me. Okay, we will move those forward. Continuing business, COVID update. Dr. Storsley? Yeah, um, not much new. Um, we talked a little bit about, and the FNF, update and I'm not sure if Jay and Aaron if you were there at that time. Um, again, not really much to update except that we are looking at um, procuring some of the Binex now uh, rapid tests. So we're working on that. Jenny has been working hard on procuring that. So more news as we get, we get closer to that and implementing those tests. I'm anticipating that there may be more questions about that coming from parents or from students themselves given that there's more you know, other schools, there's, there's comments about that in, the, in local press, things right. like that. So yep. people not knowing maybe what it is, what it might mean. So just anticipating some of that. Yeah, absolutely. There'll be communications going out to the community. Um, it's just taken a while to procure some of these for a myriad of reasons. Um, it's like every layered mitigation. <laughs> for sure, for sure. It's... <laughs> It's bureaucracy, but it's for a good reason because, you know, they need to make sure we know what we're doing and uh, we have our, our forms together, the consent forms and things like that. So much more coming out um, for sure. 
And we had to get CLIA waivers. Is that right? That's correct. CLIA waiver. Yeah. Yeah. So to Mickle's point, Amy, we have our ducks in a row internally. We're just kind of waiting on those test kits to arrive. Um, we have parent communication teed up, staff communication teed up with really robust information about kind of where we've come and where we're going and why we're testing and how we're doing so. So we're just really waiting on those test kits to get that out and ready to go. Okay, very good. I'll just add as a, as a quick update and, and um, we can share more as this gets hammered out uh, more, but in addition to navigating this year, we are actively um, planning for the fall and figuring out how, how best to navigate um, this very complex situation. Uh, with unknown variables, but we are um, uh, looking to and working um, to find ways to that, that we will be offering remote sections, not just pandemic related, right, but it's, it's going to become another um, instructional delivery um, option for families um, in the long term. And so we are, are finding ways to flexibly offer remote options in a whole variety of courses, both during the day and in the evening. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of pieces in, of the puzzle right now, a lot of things in the air, but we are actively organizing, putting that together. And, and really just in the next few weeks, we'll start asking families to, um, you know, if you signed up, for example, for freshman English, um, allowing families to select that you might want to take freshman English remotely and kind of do that class by class by class. So. Um, it's going to be very complex, but it, it's a long term, not just reacting to COVID, rather using COVID to take this innovation forward. And it's another instructional methodology for us and our family. So um, that is actively in the works um, as we speak and for the next few weeks. I think we've talked, you know, we've all talked about this as a board about how this has been an experience that. Um, we've learned so much from and our students and our teachers, everyone's learned so much from. It's been very revealing. So, um, yeah. All right, and just to that point, you know, all hybrid has not been hybrid or all remote learning has not been bad for some students. It's been very good. So like, I think to your point, yeah, we're looking at making sure we're expanding that toolbox um, mm -hmm. and, and providing more options for lots of different kinds of kids that have different, different needs. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, I've had, well, we've, we've, we've spoken about this where we've had, you know, people who've told us outright that this has been the, the taking COVID away from the conversation, but the being able to do remote has been eye opening for an experience of, you know, some, some positives have come out of it. So, yeah, you know, so that's good. Yeah, it's exciting, um, but more to come for sure. I have a quick yeah. question. Um, hasn't Stephen has, has Stevenson had a remote learning for more for a while now? I think didn't they have psychology at home or that you could I don't know. do on a remote basis? I'm not sure. Okay. So there might be some lessons learned there because I, I remember I believe I spoke to I believe it was a board member at one point saying that, they, and they said that they were already implementing. So I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. So as will we starting next year, um, outside of COVID, right? I mean, obviously it plays mm -hmm. a role in COVID, but outside of that as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions to that, Jay? No, I'm all right. Thank you. Aaron. Oh no! I'm, but Tracy, that's just a. I my mind is just exploding with the possibilities and the positive impact that could have. I mean, I know high school students that have serious illnesses, and just being able to do remote from their hospital room. Mm -hmm. So you know, something simple like that. It it's huge. Yeah. So that's I, I I see endless potential. Yeah. I know it's going to be a lot of work, but I know. <laughs> But you know what, it's that kind of really rewarding work, right? I'm making new possibilities for families. We have students who um, might need to work a few hours during the day and now they might have remote options in the evening, right? So it just opens possibilities for our families and students that, that we haven't had before, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a government report, not to take too much time on this, but uh, it written in the 80s called Prisoners of Time about schools, just how mm -hmm. locked we are into time and the clock, right? Mm -hmm. And this has just opened up 
different possibilities for kids. So it's great. Yeah. yeah. If we haven't learned, if we don't take takeaways out of this and, and latch on to the opportunities, that's right. Um, we've, we've missed something and I don't think we're missing stuff. I think we're capturing what we can. So glad to hear it. Um, okay. Moving along, new business, field trips, none at this time. Um, recommendations to approve the staffing plan of the 2021-2022 school year. Yes. Danielle? Yes, so okay. Tracy and I will be tag teaming this. Yep. Um, Mark has been uh, very involved, as has Mickle. Um, we are pleased um, this evening to bring forth our very student-centered um, summary of staffing and our recommendations for next school year. And, um, you know, our summary sheet kind of captures the, the ask, if you will, and then the secondary sheet really tells our story. So Tracy and I and Mark um, would like to kind of hang in that for a moment, if we may. Um, so annually, right, and, and you hear me um, toot the horn of our staffing team every year. It's been such an honor and privilege to work with such um, student-centered, innovative, thoughtful leaders. Um, in my second time around here. And so this has just been another um, incredible experience. We had to do things over Zoom, which proved challenging at times, right? We're usually in 1500 for weeks on end and, and have papers everywhere and things everywhere. So we had to um, innovate in the way we even just planned, but it all worked out in the end. Um, so after, without exaggeration, about 36 clock hours for the staffing team, we um, came to what we have in front of you this evening. And we, we, you know, the moment staffing ends this year, tomorrow staffing begins for next year, right? We are constantly analyzing and reflecting on what worked as part of our process, what the needs are for students, what we see on the horizon. And, and we thank you as a board for always being so supportive around, think about the trauma, right? Amy and Kathleen, you brought that forth really early on in the year to say the layers of trauma because of COVID are just incredible. So making sure that we're coming forth with um, with services and supports for children that will, right, be proactive rather than reactive in nature. Um, so we hung in a lot of those conversations around AIM. Um, we know that we made that big endeavor with your support last year and added AIM intervention, and boy, have we seen the fruits of that labor, um, so much so that we're coming back and asking for more of it. Um, AIM has been so successful with our students to close skill deficit gaps, to move students out of Ds and Fs into passing grades. Um, after hours, um, coming in and getting one-on-one -on -one support from, from our um, masterful teachers and staff has just proven so successful for our students that we, we simply need more. We're running out of time to offer children is the truth. So we want to be able to offer more. Um, we talked a lot, as we know, about block schedule, right? We said early on in the movement to block, we anticipate needing more and why, right? Supervision across the day. Um, students may grab another class, which they indeed did in electives, which we are thrilled about, right? So we knew kind of coming into this year with block, we'd be asking for more because simply our students have access to more and we want them to be able to. Um, we talked a lot about music. We talked about this at the last, I think it was, Amy, remind me, was it P-Cube last time perhaps? PQ, yeah. yeah. Um, just simply that the numbers are dwindling and all of us around that staffing table said, we are not looking at cutting that. Um, we believe our students aren't choosing chorus because they're simply afraid they won't be able to sing with their peers next year. Um, they're not signing up for guitar because they're afraid they may not be able to. So they're grabbing other electives. So we are so committed to music, as I know we all at this, in this Zoom room are, that we are allowing for a COVID kind of exception, if you will, to allow um, things to settle, but to keep a very close eye on that for next year. We don't want to be irresponsible. We want to really dig into trend data, um, but we want to give ourselves a year and get out of COVID um, to see if those selections change you know, in December of next year. So you have our commitment that we will be laser focused um, on that trend data and bringing you forth information next year related to music. Um, 
the, the other piece that we always spend a lot of time in, and I look to my right to, to Mark Kettering, is our special education across both campuses, right? Um, we have an influx, to be quite candid, of freshmen um, with IEPs. And um, in a given year, Mark and his teams work diligently to ensure they understand the needs of our incoming freshmen via IEP meetings, conferences and conversations with IEP team to IEP team to ensure those seamless transitions into high school. This year has proven even cha more challenging, right? IEPs are Zoom. Um, there isn't that natural collaboration um, as there has been in years past. Mark, please fill in the gaps if I miss something here. So we've seen an influx, I believe to the tune of 20, 25 more students with IEPs just at Central alone. And Mark, yeah. tell me if I'm off base there. No, that's right on. And we usually see anywhere from 10 to 12 students or higher um, transfer in during the summers as well. So we just anticipate, right? We, we know we have more. And then to anticipate that, the trends of a move-ins over the summer, um, we spend a lot of time ensuring and talking about um, having enough, simply enough FTE to spread across case managers um, and to have co-teaching sections for the students so we ensure they have the services they need. And that's why this year, a little different than last, we bring you a range this evening of 2.7 to 3.7. And that is simply because of our unknowns around special education. Um, we will do our, our due diligence to ensure that we, over the course from now until all those IEPs come through and Mark knows exactly what's in his buildings, um, that we will be responsible. Um, but we just ask simply for a little bit of leeway until we can figure out exactly what our children need on paper, and then when we see them next year, those things might be different. So we just want to allow for some flexibility in that domain. The other piece we are thrilled to bring to this table and recommend is an additional school psychologist in each building. Um, again, kudos to this P-cubed committee, Kathleen, Amy, Aaron, and Jay, um, from the onset of this school year saying, we know what our children will need, we know they need more, Please lean in and figure that out. Um, and after a myriad of conversations with Megan, Mike Przbilski, with our SST teams, with our counselors, which include our counselors, our deans, our social workers, our current school psychologists, we really landed in a place where we just don't have enough school psychologists. One at each building are simply diagnosticians. They don't have enough time to lean into groups, providing group interventions to children, right? They are solely diagnosticians. Um, and if you recall, last August, feels like a decade ago, we did that nice presentation, Mikkel led it, and the EBF reporting of ratios around how many school psychologists should a school have, how many social workers should a school have, school counselors. If you recall, we were spot on on every single one of them except school psychologists. The recommended ratio is 750 to 1, and we have one per building. So our ratio was sitting right around 1,300 to 1. So EBF told us that we were out of line there, right? And so we believe that no other time is better than now to be asking for that. So very simply, um, that's kind of the licensed conversation that we have. I'm going to pause so Tracy can lean in and share. Mark, another opportunity for you to say anything you'd like to add. And then I'll move on to athletics and activities. Tracy? Yeah, I, I don't really have anything new to add. I think you summarized it um, perfectly. I mean, our, our ask is really around student social emotional support um, for next year. And that's really where the numbers uh, fall. And then the same thing for special education. I mean, even pre-COVID, we heard that this incoming class was going to have some additional needs. Um, and I don't know how many initial evaluations were done in the middle schools this year um, for students needing um, special services, but the number has increased. And so we are graduating less students than we are taking in. And that number is quite a bit higher, um, as Danielle said, than it was this past year. So um, with that range, it'll offer us that flexibility. Uh, and then hopefully as we move forward, um, we can start to level off again and, and as COVID is in our rearview mirror, hopefully someday, um, we'll start to be able to figure out and get back to what we, I guess, a new normal. Thanks, Mark. 
Um, so moving on to athletics, um, we have two recommendations for increase of coaches this school year. And I must apologize on the memo from Brian Moe to me. Um, his cost of, uh, approximation was incorrect. Mine came in lower. So that's what we'll take that. Um, but we are recommending, so historically, let me start over. Historically, our girls golf program has been co opt meaning North and Central has shared that program. And Tina and Brian have had their eye on that for quite some time and just asking questions to themselves and to their athletes of why isn't this growing? Why are we getting more students involved? And some of the truth that came from our, our wonderful children was we don't feel connected to it because we're shared. We don't get to wear our green and white. We don't get to wear our black and gold. We wear orange or tan because it's a co-opt, right? We don't have our school spirit around it. So that's the hope is that by pulling these apart and having a head and assistant coach at Central for Girls Golf and a head and an assistant for Girls Golf at North, the program will grow because children will feel more connected to their home school. Uh, we will keep our eye on trend data. If that doesn't come to fruition, we will come back and talk about maybe we go back to a co-op model. But Brian and Gina are feeling pretty confident that if we parse this apart, we'll have more participants. So we'll keep you posted on that. So that's the ask in athletics. The ask in activities, I think, is a sign of the times. Last year, we brought forth nine new clubs with associated sponsors. And this year, we bring forth two additional sponsors. And simply to kind of double click my favorite term, overused, but I can, I know it, so I can use it. Um, in Color Guard, um, we only have one sponsor and it's grown by 20 members. So we'd love to get another co-sponsor in there to support the Color Guard at North. This is North only. And the second is Drumline. I've learned a lot about Drumline this staffing season. Um, and it's my understanding that Drumline is split into two highly specialized areas, right? Front ensemble and battery. Um, and really, while the two uh, practice simultaneously, the work is very different. And, and so oftentimes they have to split up and then there's just one sponsor to split that group and that, that provides some challenges at times. Um, so we're asking for a second sponsor to really support both of those main um, systems of drumline, if you will. So those are the two activities that we're bringing forth. No new activities um, at Central. Um, some remain in pilot mode, so we'll have probably more information this time next year for you. Um, so those are the two requests in activities. Seems reasonable enough. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Yeah. My last. So yeah, and I've, obviously with the color guard and that, if they're going to competitions, it just gives you also the opportunity to have another teacher present for, I've spent enough time on a band bus. <laughs> but I'm also happy to hear about the two psychologists and um, especially I think we really don't know, I mean, I know you guys kind of had an idea we might have a greater need for special students before COVID, but we really don't know what we're going to get in the fall. I right. really don't know where we are with things, and so I love the idea of getting more aim, more more uh, flexibility with special ed, and also more psychologists. So, all good things. Thank you, Erin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think all of this anticipates the need and knows the need that's coming. I mean, I don't. I think it's beyond just anticipating. It's no. It we know that it's here. Yeah. yeah. We know it, and. Um, I think this addresses a lot of what the schools, the school needs, and what the what our students need. So um, I'm glad to see all of this. Amy, for your support as always. Um, yeah. So I can see why some students might like golf because it's out in a big area. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. I could see how that might be. Yeah. Um, you know, see where that goes. We'll see. Yep. See where it happens. It's a big open space, a good walk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's more to that saying. Um, the, yeah, see where it takes it. Sure. For sure. Um, the, I'm glad, so, so the music classes that have had a decline in, enroll, in enrollment, 
Yep. There's a, so there's, there'll be a new band instructor, there right? Will. Here at Central. Right? Yes. And that'll be full time right. still. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, and then, um, and then just keep you an, a watchful eye on choir. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Choir, okay. yes. Choir, and I'm just, I'm sorry to break eye contact, but I'm also looking at some of the numbers as we speak. And uh, guitar, Tracy, I believe was really low. Um, yeah, not as low as choir. Choir is our biggest oh. concern. Biggest concern. Wasn't quite, wasn't, well, I won't get into the nitty gritty. It's not. Okay. I mean, there's, there's usually two. Good. Hasn't guitar been taught by one of the either choir or band director? Yeah. So, it's so Paul has the, taught it. Paul teaches choir and um, guitar. Um, Cand Candace also teaches it. Um, Dom and uh, Michael at Central. Can all, any of them can teach guitar. Yeah. So yeah. one of those so, kind of plug and play. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. They'll figure it out. They will. They will. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, I, I think a lot of people find the music programs to be extraordinarily important. Yes. And that this should be an anomaly just as we've supported the um, extracurricular activities after school. We haven't. We've supported those right now, too. Okay. Yep. So I would. And band is academic, but all the same, there's components of people making choices. Absolutely. But um, I think the community has put the community as a whole, when you see Ellen, the, the middle school having the vast majority, I mean, more than 50% of their, their students joining band, yeah. that says a lot. So not to mention choir. So um, there's, there's definitely something in the fabric of the community when that many students are involved in music. Absolutely. So just something I've noticed. <laughs> okay. Um, Jay. Well, good. And Aaron, you already spoke, but do you have anything else? No, I'm just. I mean, choir, I, you know, it, we need to even see a shift by second semester, so it may, mm -hmm. makes sense to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen? All good. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen. How about you, Hal? I see you. Oh, that sounds like, an, like a good, good plan, and I'll, yeah, I, I like it. So let's go for the Thank you. Okay. I know that um, Tracy hit on this at the very beginning, so um, I know you have flexibility built in for um, special ed um, as you are building out more of these thoughts and plans for um, remote, after school, who's doing what. You, you may, we may, I, I'm anticipating more conversations. I'll just leave it there. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> It's possible. I don't know what it's all going to be, but I'm anticipating more conversations. Amy, I have a quick question. Do we know if um, the State Board of Education, is, or, or sorry, Tracy, or I don't know who, actually, this, does the State Board of Education going to give us guidelines earlier than they did last year? Like, for example, it was July when we were getting guidelines on what we were supposed to do and how we were supposed to act. And um, I know we said last week that we were kind of waiting to get more information so that we could all prepare for school next year and bringing kids back. Um, but has there been any movement on getting those guys to act a little bit faster? Or is there any way that we can um, ask for some guidelines earlier in the, the uh, earlier than July, which is kind of. I, I've heard um, <laughs> no timelines about that. No uh, timelines, no timelines as of yet um i don't really expect anything very soon um but i know mickle you're aren't you going to be connecting with uh the state superintendent soon and you're uh, like yeah actually we've got a a meeting 
the Lake County Superintendents have a meeting tomorrow and Dr. Ayala will be the special guest. So I'm sure there will be plenty of spirited discussion. No, she, she's great, she's wonderful, but yeah, you know, we have these same questions and mm -hmm. well, if I come up with any information, I will let you know. Yeah, I think we'd appreciate that. And, I, and it sounds like you're going to be, everyone's gonna be pressing really hard for earlier guidelines because we have to make changes to our, our spaces and, and um, we already discussed that we don't have enough room to keep kids in the school separated by six feet. Right. Um, that means that's work for us to do. And there may be funding for that through, you know, what the federal government is, is up to right now and, and, and helping to fund schools and state and local government with, with the new stimulus plan. So there'll be funding there, but if we don't know what to do, we're sitting here, right? So nothing new, but um, I, I would love to hear more about that. Or what they're, or what they're, when they come out with a plan or a recommendation, how they're, how they're stating it because it it puts pressure on what what their recommendations for one school it puts pressure on another school that may not have the space or capacity right. that align with any of their recommendations and we know this so something may work for us but we know it doesn't work for a school right down the road right. and it it creates um, inequities or problems and puts parent parents don't under parents just on the face of it don't understand um, and communities don't understand um, and this isn't faulting any anyone it's just like they have questions and reasonably so I understand why they have questions sure but I mean, they, um, all of those things would be really helpful in how they roll things out yeah my my impression is they're they're keenly aware of the timing last year was you know was crazy, oh. right? I think they were working as fast as they could, and but mm -hmm. still, it didn't help us out a whole lot. Um, but my my sense is, and I'll get a better sense tomorrow, that they're absolutely aware that you know planning is going on, and we need more information. At, at the same time, they can throw as much money as they want at us. We can't double our space, you know. Yeah. We can't we can't double the number of our teachers, right? But so we'll see for sure. There are definitely some questions, still some looming questions about assessment. Um, certainly health guidelines as they apply to schools. I think those are top of everybody's minds. So this brings me to something that I've been thinking a lot about is that the, the amount of flexibility in our budget for adding additional people. Um, we, and how we go about doing that if we have to put on evening classes or if we have to use our space and time differently than we ever have before to bring kids in. Um, and I know this is budget related, but um, well, I imagine that would be under some sort of a special COVID um, um, grant, I'm hoping, mm -hmm. but I worry about that. I'm sure we all, I'm sure you all are worried about that. Okay, I put it out on the table, um, but it's there and um, okay. Well, Mika, we'll be looking forward to hearing, uh, we hear yelling coming from uh, Springfield or wherever she is. We know that you're in there. <laughs> no, no one's going to yell at, at uh, Dr. Ayala. But, uh, no, no, you know, we're not, uh, we're not it's, yelling. It's, we're not yelling. We're, we're suggesting, crying. Suggesting loudly. Suggesting loudly. I like right. that. Right. But Firm. She, she knows the issues. We're just going to, I think, reinforce. We, we need some decisions. Uh, we definitely like some more flexibility with assessments. Um, but again, some of that's above her uh, station. That's more along the federal government's guidelines. But now we have a secretary of education that's been just confirmed. So there may be some movement there. We'll see. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. More to come for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Amy. Any other, you're welcome. Thank you for pulling all this together. Thanks to everyone who was a part of it. I know it's a lot of work. A great it's, team. It's a huge yeah. puzzle. I know it's a puzzle. Um, any other questions from the group here? I'll just concur. Right. A fantastic job. It's just, yes. can't say great. it enough. Great job, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Tracy, Mark.
Nicole, everyone, thank you. Jessica, I'll say hi to you too. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, moving along. Um, class of 2021 graduation requirement modifications. Yeah, so um, at an earlier meeting, um, you know, some questions were asked about, do we need to, to think about modifying the graduation requirements for this current senior class, given the ongoing um, COVID issue? You'll recall last spring, the governor put out an emergency order encouraging schools to um, waive graduation requirements to a greater degree than we are asking here. Um, they waived um, a number of state requirements through that governor's order. They waived, for example, consumer ed last year. They waived the constitution requirement. They waived the SAT to graduate requirement. Um, all of that was in that emergency order. Well, that emergency order isn't, doesn't apply right now um, to these seniors. So we, we find ourselves um, in, a, in a place just having to make some local decisions, school district by school district. And um, while the degree of interruption for this class probably wasn't as significant as kind of the ceasing of school last March, right, through, through June. Um, however, it's been remote through January 19. Um, we have a number of students still, right, in and out of remote, um, and teachers trying to balance students in front of them, students not. And so it's an ongoing challenge for our seniors. And so we are recommending that we reduce our graduation requirements um, to those of the state of Illinois. And so the primary difference between the state of Illinois' graduation requirements and ours is the number of electives uh, required. All of the cores, for the most part, are the same. Um, with the exception of social studies, they have a two-year social studies requirement. We have three. Um, so that's like a, you know, an elective sort of third year of social studies that we require. So the differences really fall into electives. And while I'm, I'm happy to report that, that we've been able to close a lot of gaps um, this year for, for students that were behind, um, those that continue to be behind are, many of them, um, it, they're behind because of electives. They made choices. They couldn't engage effectively in their, in their elective courses. So they didn't put their energies there. They put their energies toward English, math, science, social studies. And so some of our students that are credit deficient are credit deficient because of electives uh, due to this COVID situation. So we don't wanna prevent them from moving on with their life and graduating um, and having to return as super seniors um, because of this issue. So our recommendation is that we go to the state of Illinois graduation requirements. Um, we, we can't go any lower than that without a waiver. So we would just like to adopt the state of Illinois graduation requirements for this class and this class only. We will revisit each subsequent class um, as appropriate each year. And if we feel like modifications are appropriate, we will ask. Um. This all seems reasonable. Um, we don't Thanks want to. Doing it. Yeah. yeah. That seems fine. Part we're talking seniors who probably teachers have been engaging with them all year of what are you, what is your plan for next year? And yeah. so they've probably been focusing on that. Yeah. Yeah. We we have we as we have been encouraging the whole idea of what do we need to do? Yes. What 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 is a reasonable pathway to help kids get over that finish line? Mm -hmm. And so this seems, this is within the state requirements. Yep. Um, I can't imagine someone didn't try to finish their, their special elective. Yep. Um, and so this seems to be very reasonable to me. So um, I saw a thumbs up from Jay and just heard from, Aaron, um, anyone else? Kathleen? Seems like the compassionate thing to do, especially now that we're concerned about the well-being of children, our, our children. Yep. It, it just seems like the right thing to do. And thank you so much for being on it. It's great. I mean, all these little things just make life, it, I'm sure it will make life just a little bit more bearable for some child. And that means everything to them. Yep. If it gets them through, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had asked Tracy about this, about whether or not we need to, and I think she just addressed it, but just make, just keeping an eye on what needs to be, if there needs to be anything addressed with um, other classes going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't want, you know, there to be a night, you know, like taking opportunities away from someone taking a fine arts class or taking it, you know, like stripping that away that has been something that has been augmented in our curriculum. So, um, so I'm glad they're, they're still keeping an eye on it. So um, just bring in awareness that I had asked that question. Yeah. Um, Hal, you're here. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, but I, I just think that it's, um, it's got to be, a, for, for some students, it's got to be a nice pressure release valve kind of thing where, right. okay, the pressure's off on following through and getting all those um, electives taken care of. So yep. yeah, it, it seems like that's the right thing to do. Thank you. That would, thank you for the thoughtfulness for, for the students. Thank you. Will they find out tomorrow <laughs> soon? Well, once the, it's got to have to pass it. Meeting. Oh, that's right. Next week. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Friday the 12th. Yes. One, <laughs> At 12 or 1 a.m. We'll just send one it One year later. God, give them some relief. We'll pass it. We will pass it. Tell them now. We're babies. <laughs> no, it's okay. Whatever. No, I know. Can't pass. No action can be taken out of this meeting. I'm a stickler. <laughs> But if you draft the email, we won't blame you. you okay. Know? <laughs> okay. Start drafting it. <laughs> there you go. It's start, possible. Start drafting. Yeah. Counselors may be looking at you know, credit checks. You know, might might have an idea that maybe that's maybe something slipping look at. some smiley faces into some <laughs> <laughs> some notes. Yeah, that's all right. We're not. We're we're not. Oh, anyway. Okay. I'm not, a, I'm not a stickler. I'll just go ahead. Do it. <laughs> I just, we just can't, I, we just can't, no action be taken out of this committee meeting. However, smiley faces are allowed. Yes. <laughs> there it is. That's all she wrote. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> all the emo uh, emojis now, Amy, on the screen. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, moving along, board policy review. We don't have any this evening. Oh, I know it's a refresher for once. I know we've gone about nine months, I know, but I'll get you next month. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, closed session. We do have a need to go into closed session. Yes. Yeah. So I will let Dr. Storsley take care of that. And I will say um, I have a, mo a motion to go into closed session. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right, so it is 8-12. Is everyone here? Yes. No, I, I so. getting, no, I don't think so. No? I have to wait for, I have to wait and make sure that, um, I have to make sure that Aaron's here. Aaron is. I'm here. Yep. Okay, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was looking at, at Mikkel, so, okay. All right, so it is 8-12, and the PQ, um, Closed session. Uh, Amy Knudsen Strack, uh, board member. And I'll just roll call it here for all of you so you can all sign. So then, uh, Mikkel? Mikkel Storsley, superintendent. Danielle? Danielle Carter, director of HR. Aaron? Aaron Westfall, board member. Hal? Hal Sloan, board member. Uh, Kathleen? Kathleen Conlon Wasik, board member. Tracy. Tracy Landry, assistant superintendent. Jay. Jay Reynoso, board member. I think I got everyone. Okay. All right. Take it away. Start very brief this evening. Michael, do you mind if I dive in? 
very brief, just simply wanted to share uh, back to our staffing recommendations. Um, the only riff that resulted out of the conversation, the reduction in force that resulted was Vinny Vitali. He is a life fitness teacher over at North. Um, unfortunately, with the dipping enrollment, life fitness has taken a hit. And so he will be reduced from a 1.0 to a 0.4. So that will just come through in resolution to the board next week. But I just wanted to give you that heads up in advance. Um, we are excited that Vinny also has his LBS1 special education endorsement. So when things land at Central for SPED, our hope is that Vinny will be able to grab that additional FTE if he so chooses to be life, fitness, and special ed. Um, so I just wanted to put that in the room in closed session that Vinny is the impact as it relates to one RIF, um, and that will show up next week in resolution. So that was it, Amy. I just simply wanted to share that here. All right. Thank you for that courtesy. Um... Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, um, we will adjourn, or we will come out of closed session. It is 8.14. Thank you. We need a motion, I think, right? Motion in a second. Okay, motion to come out of, uh, okay, motion to come out of closed session. Second. I need a second. Second. Okay, it was Jay. All right. Just waiting on Jess. It's Jess. I think so. No, nope. she, she left. She stepped away. Okay. Okay. All right. Do you see us again, Jenny? I have all of you. Go ahead. Okay. So we're reconvening the meeting at um, 8.15. All right. Uh, personnel recommendations. Danielle. Yes. So this evening we bring forth some new rec uh, recommendations to hire in various areas. Um, we bring forth um, a familiar name. Um, Felicia Como Walker has been on the docket and off the docket several times this year. Um, she was a paraprofessional with us in person. Um, and then uh, she actually moved away. And we were so sorry to lose, lose Felicia. And given the number of special ed students that remained remote at Central, um, Mark and his teams decided it would be wonderful to have a remote paraprofessional. So we posted for that position. And we are thrilled to offer that to Felicia. So that's kind of a nice Cinderella story. We always hate to lose our, our incredible staff. And so to be able to bring Felicia back for the remainder of this year is something quite special. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention as a board. Um, we do have several resignations. Please note Josh Peterson, current department chair of special ed, is resigning back to the classroom. So he's not leaving us. He's just chosen to step back into the classroom. His letter is, 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 is lovely and so kind, yet kind of misses that, that element. So I just wanted to clarify that here. I was that being worried for a second. Yeah, thank you for letting right. us yeah. let, clarifying that because I read it and I had to reread it and I wasn't. Yeah, well, okay, good. Ask if everything's okay with him and his family. With him, or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's just chosen to, to make the shift back to the classroom to get closer to children. So uh -huh. so thanks for thanks for the moment for me to put that clarity in the room here. Um, and then a letter of transition um, where our wonderful instructional coach, Shana Pickett, has decided again to go back to the classroom um, and return to science in a way that she's very excited about. So. Um, those are just some of the highlights in our staffing recommendations this evening. So, yeah. All look good. Thank you. Right. Any questions, Erin? No, I just love this that teachers are like, yeah, I want to go back to the classroom. Right. And I want to get back to you. <laughs> and I love that we, that you guys as an administration embrace that yeah. and make it work. Sure do. Just wanted to give a special shout out to uh, Miss Piggott, a phenomenal teacher. She was my uh, biology honors teacher my freshman year. So thank you for her back in the classroom. She is phenomenal. She's great. Yeah. 
All right. Um, any further questions, Kathleen? No, it's wonderful. It's all good news. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hal? Oh, that's, um, yeah, I, I agree with um, being, allowing people to go back into the classroom and God bless them for wanting to. That's just, it, it's, uh, it's a special, it's a special calling and, and I'm, I'm thrilled for them and I'm thrilled for the district because I know the students who get those teachers are going to be very benefited by that. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Amy. You're very welcome. Okay. Uh, topics for future committee or board meetings. Jay? Uh, not necessarily a, a topic because I'm looking at the timeline and it says April 8th. Uh, so that will be after the election. Or I don't, we haven't, we won't seat the new members, correct, by then? Okay. I think just as long as we talk about, okay, let's go back to policy. How, how do we introduce our new board members to that so that they're acclimated uh, well to our process? Yeah, the reseating, I think, is the 22nd. So, FYI. April 22nd? Correct. Yeah, the process will be, um, well, yes. I'll, I'll hold on that for a second. We will reseat and um, committee reassignments at that time as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we'll be doing the oath via Zoom, so. Oh, Lordy. So, Amy, you and I can just connect at some point. Let me know if you want me to start rolling policy in next month, just be a review of our own or not. So just let me know what your timeline is, and, and I will do whatever, whatever you guys want, so. I think we saw that the next press episode issue it's coming out in June, I believe. So that will be the next set of new policies that um, will need to come to the board. And the word on the street is that's a big one, right? It's a big one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That'll be right after the legislative session, so I'd be surprised if it was small. Yes. Right. Aaron is correct. Um. I'm always in favor of continuing to move forward. So um, I, I would, I would just keep going with the policies as we have them. And then um, if there's, as we were planning on doing in April, which the next meeting is for the next policy meeting, which is right. So um, and then after that, things will be what they are. So we'll take it from okay. there. So then we'll start over with section one. Mm -hmm. we're, um, we've gone through the whole thing. We need to start over. So mm -hmm. we'll start with section one again, then in April. I think so. Um, Okay, um, Aaron, did you have anything? No, I think uh, I think we're busy enough as it is. <laughs> okay, uh, Kathleen or Hal? Kathleen's already given us a, a list of, of things that she that for us to consider for the next several months. So those are already going forward. Everyone should have great. received those, yeah. And yeah, those are based on, yeah, on what you guys all want. So you have time to think yeah. about what you want to do. So we're all good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
All right, well, it is 8.23 and we can adjourn. Thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful. Need a motion? Yes, any motion? Oh, thank you. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. I don't think I've ever forgotten that. <laughs> I've just said enough emotions tonight. Any motion to adjourn? Thank you. Second. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.